we often hear two sets of worried people when we talk about pensions. And one of them is, oh, no, that we don't have enough money to have pensions. And then on the other hand, oh, technology is going to take over workers, jobs, and there's going to be masses of unemployment. Both of those things cannot happen at the same time. If technology is truly taking over workers, then it means that we have a surplus of workers. And actually, we are so rich that we can just <laughs> have a lot of people not work. It is true that money is sort of a socially agreed measure of value, but it's often one that is very flawed. It often overlooks a lot of activities that are valuable. I think we have to get to the root of what is valuable in our system and then adjust money to reflect that true version of value. This is the MMT Podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. Hi, I'm Christian Riley, and welcome to the Modern Monetary Theory Podcast. You can find us on Twitter at MMT Podcast, and you can support the show by going to patreon.com slash MMT Podcast. If this is your first time hearing about MMT, you might want to listen to our first three episodes for an introduction, which I've linked to in the show notes, along with some other things that relate to this particular episode. A couple of announcements before we dive in. For any UK listeners in the Midlands, on the 30th of May, I'll be interviewing author Corey Doctorow about his new book, Red Teen Blues, which is a fantastic neo-noir crypto heist thriller. So I'm looking forward to talking to him in person all about that at a live event in Nottingham on Tuesday, the 30th of May. And in other book news, for our Patreon subscribers, in the show notes to this episode, there are links to the audio of the book book launch of MMT Key Insights Leading Thinkers, which took place on the 20th of April. If you're not a subscriber, don't worry. Video of the event will eventually be available on the Gower Initiative for Modern Money Studies website. Check out the show notes for details about the upcoming event in Nottingham with Corey Doctorow and for a link to where you can support this podcast financially via patreon.com slash MMT podcast. And as I always say, because I always mean it, your support in other ways, whether it's by recommending us to other people or just by listening and spreading the word about this stuff really helps too. So thanks as ever for the time you put into understanding MMT. Let's dive in. Welcome one and all to the MMT podcast. I'm Christian Riley. And I'm Patricia Pino. And we are continuing our conversation about Stephanie Kelton's bestseller, The Deficit Myth. This is part six. We hope you'll check out the other five, which I've linked to in the show notes for this episode. And today we're on to chapter six, which is entitled you're entitled. And Stephanie starts this chapter like she starts all the previous chapters with a myth. And I'll read out that myth in a second. But where Stephanie talks about the American programs, Social Security and Medicare, which are government funded retirement and health benefits, I've substituted the UK equivalent. So when adjusted for Britishness, the opening paragraph reads, myth, Government schemes such as the NHS or the state pension are not financially sustainable. We can't afford them. End quote. Patricia, why is that a myth? Well, Christian, that is a myth because the government isn't like a business and the NHS isn't like a business. They don't have to earn currency before they spend it. They have the backing of the currency issuer, the government. And so as long as the government continues to fund it, then we can afford the NHS. The real challenge is making sure that it's well staffed, that it has the right equipment, that it has the right facilities, all of that. But that has nothing to do with making it financially sustainable in the way that a household or a business might be. We check this against Professor Kelton's answer in Deficit Myth. She writes, as long as the federal government commits to making the payments, it can always afford to support these programs. What matters is the economy's long run capacity to produce the real goods and services people will need. I mean, that is pretty much, I mean, I don't know who said it better, actually. I think you did, Patricia. Well, Stephanie, it's a tough act to follow. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So Stephanie writes about how they've got this problem in the States, which is that when President Roosevelt set up Social Security in 1935, he thought it'd be a good idea to have it, quote unquote, funded by a trust fund. And the idea being that if people could see their money going into what looks like a pool of savings, 
then they'll feel entitled to benefit from that pool of savings because they paid into it. They deserve to get paid out of it. As I read it, Stephanie's saying that Roosevelt thought that that would protect Social Security from future administrations who might not share his vision. And the decision to do that has its logic, but it creates a problem. It's a double-edged sword, isn't it? Yeah, it gives a gift to people that want to dismantle the parts of government that actually help people, the NHS, state pensions. Patricia, could you talk about what our problem is as MMT is when people think of public sector goods and services as being funded, quote unquote, funded by a pool of savings? Well, the first problem I have, at least, is that it makes all social programs contingent on increased taxation. If what we're saying is in order to spend on the NHS, a pound on the NHS, we need to first tax a pound from the public. And that's not how things really work. If you're taxing somebody that doesn't spend their money, then it may not do anything to allow you to have the NHS. It's about making resources available, right? That taxation. But if there are already resources available, if there is unemployment, if there are things for the government to buy with its currency already, then there is no need to increase taxation. So it creates the false perception that we are poor because the belief that, oh, we need to tax first before we can fund social services, then if we're in a recession or if the economy isn't doing that well, then our capacity to tax reduces. And then people think, oh, well, we can't afford the NHS anymore. And that's actually (laughs) the opposite. We need more spending when the economy isn't doing so well. And it should be counter-cyclical, not pro-cyclical. And so I think that encourages a pro-cyclical behavior. But there is also another problem that I have with it, which is that it creates a perception that you are entitled to a portion of the NHS, which is proportional to the amount of tax that you pay. And that means, of course, if our taxes are based on income, because if we have a progressive taxation system, we might choose to tax the rich more than we tax the poor, then that sort of implies that the rich have more of an entitlement to the NHS than the poor do, right? And that's wrong. And that has nothing to do with how things work. So those are my two issues with it. Uh huh. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And also, you said it back then, when the economy is in trouble, there's a downturn, there's a recession, the axe starts swinging, where are we going to make the cuts? <laughs> Instead of going, no, 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 with the spending power in the economy is dropping, you need to act counter cyclically, not pro cyclically. <laughs> a lot of people don't get that. They, like you say, they think the government's like a household. So the government's income's going down or it can't spend so much. It's like, no, it needs to do the exact opposite. And so, yeah, having this idea that your public services are being funded by a pool of savings is dangerous for that reason. And in fact, in this chapter, Stephanie contrasts the parts of Medicare funded by trust funds with the parts that aren't namely Medicare Part D and Part B, and notes that these can never be insolvent. Why? Because the law says that any payments due must be made even if the Social Security's trust funds are ever exhausted. And for me, that's a perfect illustration of how money's a creature of law, as we've said many times. It's legislated into existence. So characterizing public goods and services being funded by a notional pool of savings makes those public goods and services vulnerable because if it suits a political agenda, that notional pool of savings could always be depicted as being on the brink of bankruptcy. (laughs) When was the economy not in trouble? But Patricia, what does a state pension fund look like through the MMT lens? Well, I guess it's the same as national security, right, for the NHS. We have funds in inverted commas, It's a fund, but it's actually just government payments. So again, it's sustainability has to do with, for example, making sure that there are enough people of working age who are able to provide goods and services to the people, to the pensioners who are already claiming these benefits, right? That's the challenge. It's got nothing to do with how much money there is in the pot because there is no pot, right? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. There is no real pot. It's just a symbolic (laughs) pot, I guess. I think the first time I heard this was L. Randall Ray said it, the government only spends one way, whether it's on the military or on a pension payment or a nurse's salary. So that's by changing reserve balances at the central bank with keystrokes. As Stephanie has written elsewhere to paraphrase, the UK government is the scorekeeper for the pound. It spends or taxes by adding or subtracting points from its scoreboard. So the government could keep a running total 
for instance, of national insurance payments as they come in and call that total a fund and say that it's funding some part of government expenditure, that particular expenditure has to come out of that fund. But in reality, what's happening when they do that is they're just putting an arbitrary condition on when and where the government can make payments to certain recipients, right? And they do that, it seems to me, when those recipients are people that they're generally ideologically predisposed to cut in spending on like vulnerable people retirees because people in general don't want the government to do that to cut funding to vulnerable people and we might vote so they have to create a justification that's not well we're just committed to shrinking the state or we just think that guaranteeing a socially inclusive standard of living to people when they retire isn't fair or the idea that the government's running out of money is the way they usually justify cuts, but the monetary operations part of MMT is about emphasizing that governments that issue their own currency can't run out of that currency. So we can take that off the table and talk about those real issues, which you began to talk about before, Patricia. And as Stephanie writes, MMT shows why looking at the sustainability of entitlement programs in financial terms misses the point and why the biggest challenge facing these programs have nothing to do with affordability. So Patricia, we touched on it before, affordability in financial terms isn't the challenge. So what would you say the real issues are? Well, we often hear two sets of worried people when we talk about pensions. And one of them is, oh no, we don't have enough money to have pensions and pensions are unsustainable. And then on the other hand, you have oh, technology is going to take over workers, jobs, and there's going to be masses of unemployment. And you're like, those two things are not compatible. Both of those things cannot happen at the same time. We either have enough workers to sustain the elderly population, or we don't. So if technology is truly taking over workers, then it means that we have a surplus of workers. And actually, we are so rich that we can just (laughs) have a lot of people not work. But if it's the opposite, If we truly are in trouble about pensions, then there is plenty of employment opportunities then. So that to me, yeah, that's the way I see it. We will get into the dependency ratio and stuff in a minute, but just related to this, a lot of rhetoric that demonizes people on unemployment benefits frames it as a case of them choosing a lifestyle, right? That I was going to say, Patricia, can you explain how our economic management system namely monetary policy, literally takes the choice of whether or not to be unemployed away from several million people every day by design. Well, as perhaps some people have recently seen on Twitter, we have reiterated that tax creates unemployment, right? And the whole point of having a currency in the first place is so that the government can provision itself with resources from the private sector. So it first has to impose a tax And then it has to create employment through spending. So if there is any unemployment, it's by definition a policy choice or insufficient government spending or too much taxation, depending on what your political affiliation is. But in the current system, we have people who believe that monetary policy, adjustment of interest rates specifically, is the way to control unemployment so that any unemployment out there is really just natural because the government in the long term is natural, that is. They separate the long term from the short term. So the economy adjusts itself in the long term and always tends towards that full employment. So anybody who's unemployed is effectively just simply not good enough (laughs) to be working. (laughs) So that narrative is in itself quite discriminatory because it purports that there are people out there who are just useless and regardless of how much they may want a job they're just not adequate for the private sector because only the private sector knows who is employable and who isn't of course and so interest rates come in to make short-term adjustments sometimes as the economy is adjusting to that long-term full employment in inverted commas it actually veers away from its balance and it needs to be adjusted through monetary policy and what monetary policy does or it tries to do is by increasing interest rates they're trying to reduce demand or reduce investment and create unemployment and Creating unemployment, they believe, then will bring prices down because workers will have less bargaining power, people will have less income, and vice versa. If they lower interest rates, then there'll be more investment 
and they'll create more employment. And that's the way they make short term adjustments to the employment level in order to balance the economy or maintain price stability. I know we have a lot of issues with that, don't we, Christian? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just bringing it up in this instance because when people say the problem is there's not enough people to do the work of a care economy, I think we just ought to remember we've got this system running in the background that's deliberately warehousing and damaging workers every day, right? This is people who want a job who are being kept out of the workforce every day deliberately. <laughs> and that's not my interpretation. That's what it's intended to do. But anyway, talking about the real challenges that need addressing, Stephanie writes about this famous episode when Paul Ryan was questioning Alan Greenspan in Congress in 2005, which we talked about this with Yeva Nassissian in episode 164. And I'll link to that in our show notes. But Paul Ryan's trying to make the case for privatizing Social Security. He asks Greenspan, do you believe and it's a really long question. Apologies. For, but I just think it's worth experiencing how tortured this question is, right? Do you believe personal retirement accounts as a component to a system of solvency does help improve solvency? Because when you have a personal retirement account policy, it is accompanied with a benefit offset. With that feature in place, do you believe that personal retirement accounts can help us achieve solvency for the system and make those future retiree benefits more secure? Question mark. And I think basically you want to say the word solvency and personal retirement account as many times as possible in that paragraph. And his question really just boils down to, don't you agree with me, Mr. Greenspan, or Chair Greenspan, I guess at that time, that privatizing Social Security will make its future more sustainable? And he thinks he's going to get this slam dunk soundbite from Greenspan. Greenspan says, I wouldn't say that pay-as-you-go benefits are insecure in the sense that there is nothing to prevent the government from creating as much money as it wants and paying it to somebody. So he validates the MMT view of monetary operations right there. And then he goes on to say, as we've just been saying, the real question is, how do you set up a system which assures the real assets are created, which those benefits are employed to purchase, which is also very MMT-esque. I don't think it changed Paul Ryan, though, did it? It went right over his head. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That's the challenge that we face, isn't it? Because we're trying to very slowly, I think this only happens very slowly, change people's consciousness around this issue rather than, I think people get upset because they think, oh, I should just be able to say a sentence and then people understand the monetary system a bit better and then that's going to change politics very quickly and it, or that's going to change the person's internal wiring that they've built up over two three four five decades around this and it doesn't and it's like you have to go on a journey and i think for some of us because you went to do your masters after you'd discovered MMT economics and heterodox economics. It's like having a vaccine before going uh, yeah, into it. Yeah, yeah. And I think obviously the people that are now confronted by MMT ideas, a lot of them were already into economics, which means they probably studied and put a lot of effort into the neoclassical side of things and this sort of belief in central bank independence and that unemployment's actually good and you know it shouldn't get too low and all of this. In a lot of people who are even sympathetic to MMT, who see some sense in it, it is really difficult for people to understand how fundamentally MMT changes things. So, for example, when we talked about how unemployment is created, and even the left, people who supposedly believe in a state intervention for the common good, relinquish the battle to using monetary policies, accept that monetary policies is the tool to be used. But they don't realize very often how the idea behind the use of monetary policy, how rooted that is in the perception that private sector knows best. And so it's very difficult for them to abandon that or to challenge that. Yeah, I think what, one of the big things that we're suffering from at this point is because it hasn't been challenged, you've got nobody wants to touch industrial policy. 
they're so scared of it on both sides of the political aisle over here in the UK. We've got Labour who are scared of coming across too left wing. So they're always talking about, well, it's government's role to create an environment that makes investors get involved in green tech and stuff like that, private sector investors. And that's as far left as it goes, rather than like, I know, but these projects are like natural monopolies. Private sector players can't get into this. You've got to start it. You've got to, sorry to use the P word, you've got to plan. (laughs) Yeah, planning. (laughs) Uh, uh, Wow, that word. You're a Stalinist, Christian. (laughs) I mean, whenever you talk about planning, that's interesting because it happens here as it happens in my home country, in Peru. And when I discuss policy god forbid you talk about industrial policy in a developing nation no what you are (laughs) you must be a communist if you do such a thing but actually you know we're not planning anything how are we going to solve the problems that we collectively have just privatize 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 i think that what we need to say to people who like that is like how's that working out for you (laughs) it's all we've known (laughs) now here for decades right it's not Okay. (laughs) Yeah. And if you notice, there's a lot of anxiety around planning. And you see that whenever there is a new proposal for climate change or anything that involves some collective action, people get really anxious about it. And uh, all of these conspiracy theories come in. And I'm not saying that there are no conspiracies in this world, but you can see how a lot of them are rooted in this narrative that any central planning is inherently evil. And it is worrying because we need to come to terms with the fact that we're going to have to do some central planning and we're going to have to find people that we trust to do it. It's not going to be easy, but there is no hiding in the private sector to solve these big problems. Yeah, absolutely. Before we move on, I wanted to just say that on the idea of people on benefits or entitlements, there's a part where Stephanie talks about how the demonization of people on benefits, and I'm going to quote, doesn't just force misery on the people whose lives would otherwise be improved by these programs. It hurts all of us. Our social safety nets strengthen our social bonds with one another and help to support the economy as a whole. Just think about all the grocery cashiers, truck drivers, shopkeepers, and others whose jobs depend at least partly on people spending their entitlement benefits and she puts entitlement in quotes entitlement benefits in communities all around the country end quote i love that because it goes to the first time i ever heard it said out loud was john harvey saying it's the golden rule of macro one person's spending is another person's income and that person's income then becomes their spending and on and on and i like that idea we really are all connected and so if all of us including the government spend less than we take in i.e we save our income goes down then you've got the paradox of thrift we all start getting poorer some entity has to act counter cyclically as we've been saying when that happens or eventually we'll all die so the government's uh, you know the agent that needs to and is always eventually the entity that steps up to act counter cyclically no matter how captured by right-wing or neoliberal thinking a government is it always has to step up i mean in the financial crisis the deficit shot up massively because people just were thrown out of work went on benefits the tax take went down and these are the automatic stabilizers and deficits go up automatically because of that so yeah anyway i was going to move on to the dependency ratio Stephanie writes that the dependency ratio is something we need to pay attention to. Would you mind saying what the dependency ratio is? Well, the dependency ratio is simply how many people are working versus how many people are not working and reliant on the people who are working. And I don't know if you've seen it, but Bill Mitchell has written about, and I came across this because I was reading Deborah and Jessica's chapter in Key Insights Leading Thinkers. Black Book is a great companion to the deficit myth as well, because we've got more of the British side of things in there. Yeah, it's just the British deficit myth. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. But yeah, Bill Mitchell's written about how a better measure to look at is the effective dependency ratio. There's a good passage here. The standard way of calculating the dependency ratio provides a flawed indication of the relationship between active workers relative to inactive persons. The concept of an effective dependency ratio has been developed to address these flaws. Where unpaid work is ignored by the dependency ratio, the effective dependency ratio is countered. 
So the standard dependency ratio measure ignores major productive activity like housework and child rearing. So it basically takes things like that into account. And the effective dependency ratio recognizes that not everyone of working age, however defined, are actually producing national output and income. There are many people in this age group who are also dependent, for example, full-time students, house parents, sick or disabled, the hidden unemployed, and those who've taken early retirement. And don't forget children as well. Obviously not of working age, I'm not a monster. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But children have to be considered. And in the UK, we have birth rates going down. And one of the worries about that is that we won't have enough workers in the future to sustain the elderly population. And even if we start having more children, then we still have to think about how we're going to raise those kids collectively, you know, how to make sure that we're producing enough to raise these children. Yeah, I'm just looking at this blog from Bill, and I think it's a few years ago, but he's written, for example, in August 2013, the Australian labour market data showed that official estimated unemployment was 714,100 and estimated underemployment was 964,300. Recomputing the dependency ratio, adding these underutilized workers, produces a total dependency ratio of 69.9% compared to the standard estimate of 51.3%. So, you know, that it goes up by, what, nearly 20 percentage points when you add that in. And that's before all the robots are taking our jobs stuff as well. And before we've even considered that, okay, look, if more people are needed in the field of the care economy, well, we can structure our industrial policy around that. Frankly, I think I would add the whole of the finance sector to the dependency ratio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In fact, at the MMT Key Insights Leading Thinkers book launch, Neil was saying, and I think he probably said this when we interviewed him, that like, if there's not enough capacity in the NHS, we should requisition it, like commandeer it from the private healthcare system. The private healthcare system has just paywalled these resources that we need. So let's have them. There's all kinds of things <laughs> that can be done like that yeah so i just really wanted to get over that idea that like well there's an aging population therefore the people who have the misfortune to be getting old now aren't entitled to a dignified standard of living <laughs> to me that's a false objection so it's all about the real resource constraint as we say in mmt stephanie writes quote funding ever more generous entitlement programs could push the economy beyond the real resource constraint fueling inflation and there's more to it than that. But I just wanted to jump in there and ask you, P, in a time of high inflation like now, how do we argue that the social safety net needs to be strengthened and benefits need to go up? <laughs> because people point to our current inflation as evidence that the economy has hit its real resource limits. So there's nothing for sale anymore. What would you say to that? Well, we still have a lot of unemployment and a lot of hidden unemployment, I am sure. So I don't think we're quite there where we can't afford more entitlements. Certainly disabled people have faced some brutal cuts lately, not just in terms of their entitlements, but also in terms of cuts to social services. But at the same time, we need to also make sure that we are creating employment so that we reduce the risk in future of potentially creating that issue that we don't have enough people working to support the others. So I think we need to do both, but it's not right to say, again, that it's taxation funding. I don't want to present it as that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And another thing that I like that I've brought up probably in the last three or five episodes is Fidel Kaboob's line. If we've hit the limit of our productive capacity, that's not bad news. That's good news. Productive capacity is producible. So let's allocate resources to create more of it. But the other thing I want to say is that we also have to think about the quality of the jobs we're creating. It's not just jobs for the sake of jobs. And I think in this neoliberal era, because we're under that belief of private sector knows best. So whatever the private sector sells must be because it's useful, right? But actually, <laughs> I think there are a lot of issues out there that we're not addressing and that are making people very unhappy. And as a result of that, people are resorting to consuming for the sake of consuming, because often they're trying to fix problems that 
cannot be fixed through consumption, but we try. <laughs> and that creates a lot of waste. Consumption is the only means of expression we've got. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's gratuitous. And so I think that we're actually wasting a lot of productive resources. Even those people who are doing productive things, we could be using those resources in a much better way, in a way that actually makes us more fulfilled with our lives, that actually allows us to have more family time and that doesn't create those emotional problems that we then try to fulfill with conspicuous consumption. <laughs> and while we're on inflation, we've touched on this a few times, but I think it's not a bad idea to go over it again. While we're on inflation, we want pay rises for the public workers that provide our social safety net, not just the safety net, but that fuel our future as well. That Our young people are our future. So the people who are educating the next generation of problem solvers, we want pay rises for all these people. Their wages haven't kept up with inflation for a long time. But there are those out there that argue that, say, nurses' pay going up will feed inflation. How do you address that? At the moment, inflation isn't really being caused by increased wages, though, is it? At the moment, inflation is being caused by excessive profits. And very often, politicians talk about trying to uh, avoid the wage spiral of inflation by talking about how nurses and other people in the public sector who have not had a pay rise for over 10 years, that they should just stay put and not demand anything else. But they're not really concerned about the profit spiral of businesses protecting their profits and increasing prices for that reason, taking advantage of shortages to increase their profits. And and that's the real problem that we have. That's something that the central bank is not set up to tackle, right? But why? <laughs> like, well, why? I mean, because they don't do fiscal, right? But that's the whole point, isn't it? I think that goes back to what we were discussing earlier, that the whole system is set up to blame workers for inflation. There is no excessive profits in that system. And then the extra addition to that is the whole system is set up to then blame central bank for not hammering workers, <laughs> right? Yeah. So again, there's this thing called policy <laughs> that <laughs> should really be the result of our decisions at the ballot box instead of this like, ah, well, you know, money, inflation, all that stuff. We just leave that to the central bank. We just leave that to the technocrats. It's not really got anything to do with politics. And it's like, what? <laughs> How is making workers poorer, not politics? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think with the inflation thing, two things get mixed in together. Two misconceptions, I'd say. One is the quantity theory of money, you know, MV equals PY. Or the other is the government as price setter. So I was going to take those in turns and throw it over to you, Patricia. Why, even in the monetarist framework, MV equals PY, does an increase in this thing people call the money supply doesn't necessarily mean an increase in the price level or in simpler terms people think if there's more of something out there in a market in this case it's pounds that means the individual units of that something must by definition become worth less why is that not the case with money well i think people imagine that when the central bank is issuing reserves or some people may call that printing money i don't like that term but what they're doing is effectively that throwing money out into the system and then it goes into consumers and then prices go up. But that money actually remains within the central bank and the means of transmission of that kind of money or the way that it's expected to transmit more spending is through the lowering of interest rates. So that whole monetarist thinking failed pretty quickly in the 80s. It was acknowledged that it was not possible to control the money supply because a lot of the money is actually created by commercial banks and it's really disconnected from the reserves created by the central bank because commercial banks, when they create money in accordance to the quantity of people out there who are looking for loans, so they're looking for either investment opportunities or to make purchases and who can afford to take out loans, who are credit worthy. So that in itself depends on how well the economy is doing, how much savings people have or people's incomes. So again, you cannot control the money supply and reserves, they call it base money, is one of the measures of money, I guess. Increasing the quantity of reserves does not really tell you much about 
what's going to happen with the issuance of loans and what's going to happen in the actual sector where the money is being spent. Also, there's something fundamental about the MV equals PY thing, which is if you think about that equation, E to be the only thing that goes up when M goes up, everything else has to remain constant. Yeah, so P represents the price level going up, right? And that's just an assumption that's put on that identity i'm calling it an identity instead of an equation because it has to be true by identity and those other two things the velocity of money and the output aren't constant (laughs) you're assuming full employment basically yeah you are assuming full employment and the original i think it was fisher but i'm not sure but when they describe the whole equation as you say okay this equation is just yes it's just an identity but we can make these assumptions about mv and y and about v particularly is that v fluctuates around a number so you can consider it to be constant which you can't (laughs) and again for anybody new here v the velocity of money is i think it's just literally the quantity of money divided by the number of transactions and the quantity of money by the way the quantity of money depends on what you consider money so depending on what money measure you're holding on to you will get different values of v And then you have uh, output, and in the output, the assumption is, well, output is just dependent on technological factors. So it's a natural thing, the output of the economy, and there's nothing the government can do to change that. So we can consider that to be non-fluctuating and just a constant. So the only thing that the government can do by increasing the money supply is cause inflation as a result of those two. Yeah, I do think the output being constant is the bigger thing, is the wilder assumption. It is very wild because in MMT we talk about, well, the government is creating money all the time, right? It's creating reserves which are going straight into people's incomes. Sorry, just in case there's any like pedants listening, (laughs) what Patricia is saying that like the government creates reserves and then the reserves going up results in a bank balance in commercial bank credit going up as well. So it's not that the commercial bank hands over the reserves to their retail bank customer. It's there's an extra layer there. So and we've got our episode 126 is all about that. I'll link to that in the show notes. So by definition, when the government is creating this money, they are putting resources into use, which increases output. So it's proportional to output. And so it would have, even by this equation, no reason to cause inflation if it is putting resources to use in the process of creating this currency. That's the point. As long as the spending is creating good or a service, a new widget, whatever, then it, it won't result in inflation. And also the idea that to get back to the simple model where people say, if you create more of a thing, it makes that thing worth less. You have to ignore the fact that there's a monopolist in the market. The price is what the monopolist says it is. And if we had a job guarantee, for instance, we would be anchoring the value of a pound to labor hours, basically. You want pounds as a taxpayer, as somebody that needs to earn pounds to earn a living. And the government then says what you can do to earn pounds. But instead of like, it being a sort of homogenous type of labor force that it's employing. It pays for all kinds of different things. So the way Warren Mosler says it is the government is the source of the price level, which brings us to this idea that the currency is a public monopoly. That means the monopolist is the price setter. So there's this other idea that if the government's paying more for a nurse than it did yesterday, that means it's weakening the purchasing power of its money. I mean, if paying more for something that, you paid less for yesterday is the definition of increasing prices, isn't it? So we like to say the government sets the value of its own currency by setting what the quantity of currency you'll get for a basic unit of work, effectively. So the government pays for its workers, also serves as a sort of benchmark around which the whole economy's prices adjust to. Now, there's all sorts of other factors playing into what those relative prices are. But I don't think there is anything wild (laughs) about that. I think, as I said, we have to talk about what the role of profits is here because profit margins have increased dramatically. And that is at the moment what's causing the highest price increases in the private sector. So 
curtailing those things will have an impact on those, as I said, those relative prices depend on all sorts of other factors. So that would adjust things dramatically. It's simply to talk about this in the context of a job guarantee, right? Because we are saying that government isn't just hiring a portion of the population and leaving the rest unemployed who are not in the private sector, but they are guaranteeing people a minimum wage or should they find themselves unemployed, they can take employment in the private sector. So that's a much stronger way of setting a price level. We say the prices paid by the government are the source of the price level, right? So there's all kinds of other prices as well that can be adjusted that would mean the overall adjustment in the price level doesn't go up in in that one thing that the government pays loads of money to is bondholders for doing nothing, right? So that's like basic income for people who already have money, right? If it stops doing that, that would have an effect on the price level, for instance. And so I think when you take, say, nurses whose pay has been lagging inflation all this time, so there's obviously not a wage price spiral going on when their wages are lagging inflation. <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting question because the price level is one thing, as you say, and it's quite another thing to talk about what causes the changes in relative prices. And the energy shortages we've been having, I think has been quite interesting because, of course, in order to run the economy, the government requires energy. And if it doesn't have access to energy resources within its own kind of jurisdiction, then it has to import it and it's dependent on other nations or on things that are beyond its control, right? So that's why energy sovereignty is a security issue because it's such a fundamental resource in the economy. Everything else depends on it that we need to make sure that we have what we need to run our essential services so that people can heat their homes and we don't have mass deaths in in the winter and things like that. So I think it talks about those relative prices as being a function of the relative power as well of the different entities. So you have the monopoly issue of the currency, but if you have a monopoly kind of supplier of energy that the government cannot coerce into providing its energy to it, then you have a real kind of battle there. I quite like this because it falls within the whole conflict theory of inflation, and I think it's far more complex. But I think we need to start looking at things more from that perspective. This theory of the government is the price setter because it sets the price level. It makes absolute sense. It's the only feasible explanation we have at the moment for the price level. Remember, the mainstream doesn't really have a price level theory. It has a very poor theory. It's trying to create this sort of fiscal price level theory, but it's pretty bad. But it indirectly alludes to the things MMT is saying, funny enough. But eventually it makes complete sense. But then once we need to be able to model that, to understand that, we need to be able to also try and understand what causes those relative differences between the prices that the government is paying and the prices that the private sector is paying for things. So just getting back to the deficit myth, the myth that the UK as a nation can't afford state pensions or the NHS is a secondary myth that flows from the primary deficit myth. So let's back up and just re-emphasize what that primary deficit myth is. Patricia, what is a government deficit? A government deficit is the difference between (laughs) what the government spends and what the government has taken back in taxes. And it's the private sector surplus, effectively. Yeah, so just to drive it home, the myth about the government's deficit is that it's somehow, the government's deficit is the non-government sector's surplus, and vice versa, by accounting identity. So the myth about the government's deficit is that somehow it's the same, that somehow at the same time it's the private sector's deficit, i.e. our deficit, something that we'll have to pay back because we've borrowed it, whereas a government deficit is evidence that the exact opposite has happened. The government, through its agents, have spent more pounds into existence than they've collected in taxes. And those pounds are now residing in the only place they can be residing in, which is in bank accounts held by us, the non-government sector. In other words, that's our spending money, not our liability. And the national debt is the sum total of all the deficits ran minus any surpluses since the currency came into existence. So as L. Randall Ray puts it, the national debt is not what we owe, it's what we own. But because of the persistence of the idea that the government's like a household where it can only spend what it takes in, the state pension could be depicted as 
elderly people selfishly demanding some of this limited pool of money the government's only just managed to wrench from the hands of hard-working people so morally pensioners should be sacrificing some of their income so that there'll be money left over for future generations and when this talking point comes up i always like to refer back to the title of one of stephanie's very first papers which is can taxes and bonds finance government spending now in a word patricia (laughs) Can taxes and bonds finance government spending? No, they can't. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, can a government even save its own currency for a rainy day? No, it can't. (laughs) And why is that? I mean, I can save money in a bank account. Why can't the government do it? Because it's all just accounting. And every time the government spends, it's creating money. It, It spends by passing bills in parliament. It doesn't need to have an account. It has its own bank. Do you have your own bank, Christian? (laughs) (laughs) Maybe if you had your own bank, you could issue your notes with your face on them and you would have unlimited ones. But I would have to lay on a tax, wouldn't I? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Which would require the force of law. Yeah. So you might need an army as well. Yeah. Yeah. And some police. All right. Well, look, Rome wasn't built on a day. Maybe I can put that on together. (laughs) But, you know, conceptually, money is an IOU and money is a state's IOU right? If the government's saying, I owe you one pound off your tax bill, that's what a pound is saying, if it could talk, right? And I've said this before, apologies if anybody listening has heard this too many times, but if I write, I owe you 10 pounds on a piece of paper and give it to myself, I've got a 10 pound asset and a 10 pound liability, i.e. nothing, right? If I'd have put like six more zeros on the end of that, same thing. That That's what I mean by the government can't even save in its own currency. So anyway, the government spending on retirees is not revenue constrained. We talk about that a lot on the podcast. The government can't run out of money. So given that, how should we talk about the state pension? Because it seems to me we've had to develop this lazy shorthand way of talking about the state pension because we can't get people to think of a dignified life for elderly people as a human right. So we have to uphold this idea that retirees deserve their state pension, not because they're human, but because they've been paying into a fund their whole life and they should get their money back. And, you know, what might be a better way to make the case that being comfortable and not working for a few years before you die ought to be a human right in a civilized society? I think if we go to the root of it, a lot of it is rooted in this idea of what is value, right? And I'm sorry, I'm going a bit abstract here, but I think a lot of people think that what you earn during your life is representative of the value that you've created. And that's not true. I think I think we have various kind of different versions of what value is. And it is true that money is sort of a socially agreed measure of value. But it's often one that is very flawed. For example, it doesn't take into account the work that parents do in raising their children. It doesn't recognize that as valuable, even though it is incredibly valuable. And it often overlooks a lot of activities that are valuable that people do for free. So again, it's rooted in this idea that only the private sector creates value. So the wage is the measure that you should take for that value. So If we start from that and then we say, well, (laughs) what you're saving, then it's the bit of the value that you've added that you want to reclaim in the future, right? That's, I think that's how people see it, but that's very flawed. And I think we have to get to the root of what is valuable in our system and then adjust money to reflect that true version of value as much as possible. So, I think that we have to start with saying that if people have worked all their lives or or a number of years, whatever qualification you want to give it, then we say at this point, once you've completed this many years of work and doing this many hours, then you have a right to a dignified old age where you can do certain things. You can go out for dinner once a week or go out for holidays once or twice a year and have enough for your clothing, enough for your food to eat nutritious meals. And if we started seeing that way, then we'd come to a more, a fairer version of what pensioners should be getting. Well, at the same time, within that discussion has to be what is it that we can, as a country, have the productive capacity to provide, right? And also, I don't want to ignore also that we need to talk about disability as well, like because obviously 
there is going to be a problem if we go, oh, well, you're only entitled to dignity in retirement if you've spent all this time working and there are people who are disabled. I think they're entitled to dignity even though they can't work. So we just add that in as well. I think the issue is that the private sector provides jobs. It doesn't really care about disabled people. It doesn't really care, as, I mean, to provide jobs that suit disabled people. So we tend to try and force disabled people into try and take on these jobs that are really badly suited to them. And of course, they're going to have more needs and they're going to need support from the population who is working in better paid jobs. But I do think we also have to think about it's not just a matter of, okay, you're disabled and stay at home forever, removed from society, and then just have this money and that be it. I think part of provisioning for disabled people means giving them the choice, as a choice, of taking part in activities that we could consider work, and they may create social relationships and make friends and things like that, but only in as much as they are willing and able to do it. And so the job guarantee is a much better way of achieving that than a private sector that is solely focused on profit. Yeah, and the way I think I've heard Pavlina talk about it and other MMTs about the job guarantees, we're looking to make the job fit the worker. Exactly. Not the other way around. We're not trying to hammer the wrong shape into the wrong hole <laughs> peg-wise here. The way I've been thinking about it, just in general about pensions, you know, if people are going to insist on it being transactional, then the productive output of our current retirees at the time they were working was what clothed and fed and sheltered and entertained the people who couldn't work at that time. And so if you considered that to be fair, then it's still fair. So the productive output of workers today should be doing the same for retirees today. And I think looking at it that way, it would play nicely into this Oh, the robots are taking our jobs narrative because then you get to say, oh, well, great, you need less work hours for the same level of output. Now there's more people to address the dependency ratio, quote unquote, problem. And there's more people freed up to do this work in the care economy, which can be well paid. There's no reason for technological advances to lead to mass unemployment. There's opportunities there. I also like the phrase social safety net, I think, because there are plenty of safety nets to shield you if you make a bad business decision, like bankruptcy laws and incorporation and limited liability. And the idea behind all of those things is you can only lose so much for making a bad decision, right? And so and I think if business owners are getting those kind of protections, why not the rest of us? But anyway, let's say we debunk the deficit myth and we're now in a world where people know that the government can afford in financial terms to provision retirees at a socially inclusive level. But then there's this other talking point that often surfaces, this idea that people are living longer. And this is often the justification for raising the retirement age. How do you think about that, P? Well, again, it's like, I thought it was meant to be a benefit, but apparently it's not living longer. I don't understand why we're having this problem. We have all this technology, we have all these people looking for good jobs. And what is the problem? Why can't we just keep sustaining our elderly population? If the government was truly concerned about the amount of retirees that are living into an older and older age, then the government would invest more in infrastructure, invest more in technology that makes our productive processes much more efficient. And that's the way to tackle that problem. And that goes right to the thing that Greenspan and we've been saying about, and we said it when we spoke to Yeva on that episode I referred to earlier. That's how you ensure those goods and services are there <laughs> for the retirees to spend their money on. You've got to spend now, you've got to invest now to make sure they're there in the future. But that would mean industrial policy, Christian, and we don't like that, do we? <laughs> All right. Before we go, let's circle back to the original myth that this chapter starts with. The myth is that we, as a nation, are broke and we can't afford dignity for retirees or first-class health care free at the point of delivery. Patricia, what would be your parting shot to those that want to continue this myth? Money is not the problem. The problem is simply how are we going to put resources to good use? And that means real resources, not money. Short and sweet. I'll round off by paraphrasing something that Stephanie said back at the Fiscal Sustainability Conference in 2010. 
in answer to the regular question that MMT economists get, which is, this is so important and it's not that hard to grasp. Why don't politicians use MMT framing when they're talking about government finances? And in this conference, she says something like, when we talk to politicians behind closed doors, they actually say, yeah, I understand this and I agree with you, but I can't talk like this in public. And our job, she's talking about the people at the conference, our job is to make it safe for politicians to talk like this. And for me, I think that's the intent behind Stephanie's book, to get the word out there about this uncontroversial fact that currency issuing governments spend by keystroking money into existence, and that there's a forgotten purpose behind having a modern monetary system, which is for the government to employ people and pay for resources to provision itself, systems not brought into being to create employment plus some unfortunate but necessary unemployment, which is how we run the system now. So there's unequivocally no good reason for a country that issues its own currency to have any level of unemployment, underemployment, or for that matter, for it to lack a decent, fully funded care economy. So as I always say, there's so much more fantastic stuff in this book than there is time to talk about it. So we'll leave it there for now. We'll do more of these Deficit Myth episodes as time permits. And as always, we recommend anybody listening to buy the Deficit Myth, or if you've already got a copy, buy another one and send it to your MP. (laughs) But for now... Thanks, as ever, for the time you put into understanding MMT. And thanks for joining me and Patricia today on the MMT podcast. Bye, everyone. That was the MMT podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. Don't forget... You can support the show through Patreon, starting at a dollar a month, and get access to patron-only episodes. You can do that by going to patreon.com slash mmtpodcast. You can also find me on Twitter at mmtpodcast, and you can find Patricia on Twitter at Patricia N. Pino, and you can email us at mmtpodcast at outlook.com. Thanks for listening, and we hope to hear from you.